Hello everybody. Today I would like to talk to you about the human cause of climate change and global warming. And if we have time, I will also talk about the current climate model, how good it is at predicting climate, and some areas where it needs to be further refined. So that's our agenda. Let's get started. The first thing we're going to talk about is that human activities emit a large quantity of greenhouse gases and they have a large annual effect as well as a large cumulative effect. Since the Industrial Revolution, humans have increased the rate at which CO2, uh, methane, CH4, and N2O, nitrous oxide, are emitted into the atmosphere. The main sources of these are things such as burning fossil fuels, obviously, but also agriculture and deforestation. And they work by causing more decomposition of organic matter and less absorption of CO2 by plants, which are now missing from those ecosystems. Atmospheric CO2 levels are now higher than at any time in the last 800,000 years, and they are expected to keep rising. In fact, we now know that 2018 had the largest single year total of emissions uh, in recorded history. The Concentration of CO2 in the environment has gone from the pre-industrial level of 288 parts per million to the current level of somewhere around 410 parts per million. I know it says 406, but that data is a little bit old. Methane levels are also high, as we're going to see in the next slide. So here is a look at five greenhouse gases. And you can see here are the estimated pre-industrial concentrations. And those concentrations are obtained by looking at things such as ice cores. And here is the 2010 concentration, which is, of course, now nine years out of date. And um, all of these have gotten higher, with the possible exception of CFCs. So carbon dioxide has increased from 288 to around 410 right now. Methane has increased from 848 parts per billion to 1,800 parts per billion. Nitrous oxide from 285 parts per billion to 323 parts per billion. Chlorofluorocarbons are not made in nature. They're, only, they're synthetic chemicals, and they have increased from zero to 530 and 245 parts per trillion for the two different chlorofluorocarbons, 12 and 11, that you can see on this table. We can see that there's a correlation between increasing mean temperature in the orange and the black line behind them is carbon dioxide concentrations. And in addition, if you want to look at the red line, that is the running mean, the running average, probably a five-year running average to show you what's happening. And we'll get back to this data in a little bit. Now we want to look at evidence that tells us that human activities are playing a key role in atmospheric warming. The IPC 2010 update, to which we referred in the last lecture, was written by about 2,500 scientists using thousands of data sets. It examined over 1,800 peer-reviewed scientific papers, said that it is 90 to 99% likely that lower atmosphere is warming. Now don't forget, scientists like to couch everything they say in guarded terms. And they say the warming has happened especially since 1960, mostly from human-caused greenhouse gases, and the Earth's climate is changing as a result. They also said that increased greenhouse gas concentrations will likely trigger significant climate disruption this century. There will be ecological disruption and economic disruption and social disruption. And some people have predicted large fatal events, and we will see if that is true. Certainly, the large hurricanes were experienced, and their death tolls seem to have some aspect of enhancement by climate change. Let's move on. So what is the evidence that humans are responsible for the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? It turns out that human emissions are still small compared to natural emissions. However, human emissions appear to play a major role in changing the atmosphere concentration. So let's look at what that means. So here are some testable predictions if CO2 that is warm in the atmosphere is human generated. First, the pattern in changing atmospheric CO2 should be obvious when looking at the changing human CO2 emissions. In other words, the two should correlate. Second, 
Since fossil fuels have low levels of C13, the ratio of C13 to C12 should be falling if global CO2 increases due to fossil fuels. Now let's take that apart. There are two isotopes of carbon, carbon-13 and the much more common carbon-12. Plants prefer carbon-12 to carbon-13, and therefore they tend not to photosize C13 as often as they photosynthesize C12. And that means plants and plant products have a lower ratio of C13 to C12 than the atmosphere does. So if the atmospheric change in carbon dioxide is due to fossil fuels, which is a plant product, the ratio of C13 to C12 in the atmosphere should be falling. Finally, if increased CO2 is due to burning of fossil fuels, as we suspect, then oxygen levels should be decreasing because that is what the fuels are combining with. So oxygen should be falling. Let's go and look at the evidence. So here's number one. And what we can see here is we can see that even though the CO2 level in the atmosphere is huge compared to emissions, there is an incredible correlation between human emissions, the lower line, cumulative human emissions, and the upper line, atmospheric CO2 levels. So we are seeing exactly what was predicted. Second, let's look at C13. As I said earlier, carbon has three isotopes, C12, the most common, C13, about one molecule in 100, and C14, which is radioactive and quite rare, but is responsible for radiocarbon dating. Plants prefer the lighter isotopes and so have a lower C13 to C12 ratio. You will remember that the 13 and the 12 refer to the atomic mass of the carbon. Petroleum is made of plants and so it also has a lower C13 to C12 ratio than the atmosphere. If fossil fuels are the cause of the increased atmospheric CO2, then the C13 to C12 ratio in the atmosphere should be decreasing as well. Now, in this graph, it's a little bit difficult to tell, but the way they've done it, if this red line goes up, it means that the C13 levels are going down. And as you can see, the black line here is, is CO2 as it's going up, and the C13 levels are following along with it. And they plotted it this way so you could see the correlation between the carbon dioxide levels themselves and the C13 going down. Now, tree rings tell the same story. Tree rings are made by plants, by trees, from photosynthesis. So the material in them should be relatively depauperate of C13. And as the C13 ratio is going down in the atmosphere, it should also be going down more in the plants, which are picky. It turns out that there are a lot of people who look at tree rings and that we have tree rings dating back thousands of years because we can find pieces of wood which still have the rings in them, we can radiocarbon date them, and then we can look at their C13 to C12 ratio from all the little layers in there. Now, aren't you glad there's somebody in the universe, well, I guess it's somebody on the planet, who does that? I sure am. So what does the data show? You could probably guess it, right? The ratio of C13 to C12 has never been as low over the last 10,000 years for which we have remnant pieces of wood, as it currently is. And here's the kicker. C13 to C12 started to decline in tree rings in the 1850s, which is precisely the time that large amounts of fossil fuels began to be used in the well-named Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution, we know, was fueled by fossil fuels. And finally, we're going to look at atmospheric oxygen levels. And as you can see here, carbon dioxide levels are going up, 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 up in a nice linear fashion. And nobody really measured precisely the oxygen levels. And they started in the 1990s when somebody said, hey, you know what? If we're burning fossil fuels, the oxygen levels should be dropping. And whammo, they're going down. Let us take stock of where we are. The evidence clearly suggests the planet is getting warmer and that this is due to CO2 increase and that it is specifically CO2 released by human beings that is causing the warming. Are there other causes? For example, some people claim that an increase in solar activity is the cause. You'll hear this often from the climate change deniers. How about our climate model? Some people claim that it has been developed by people with a political axe to grind. Is that true? We want to look at that. And 
Are there any uncertainties in the model? We'll come back to that later in this talk. Is the sun to blame? If the sun's output is increasing, as some climate change skeptics claim, then both the lower and the upper atmosphere would be heating because more input means the stratosphere would absorb more heat on the way in, and so would the troposphere, the lower level, and they would both be heating together. But if it's heating from below, then only the troposphere will be heating, and in fact, the stratosphere should be cooling. So if CO2 is the reason, then that's heating from below because the heat is bouncing off the Earth or, or being re-emitted by the Earth, really. The greenhouse gases are trapping it and sending it back to Earth. So the lower level should become warmer. Let's go to the videotape and see what we see. Look at the lower stratosphere. That is the second level up, not the lowest level, but the second level up. It has been cooling since 1960. Look at the upper troposphere where the green, most of the greenhouse gas absorption is taking place. It has been increasing since about 1965 or so. So the sun doesn't seem to be the cause, but let's look at what scientists actually have to say about this. At least three separate scientific analyses have concluded that atmospheric warming is not due to an increase in the sun's output. Over the last 200 years, the sun's output has actually decreased, so we should be getting cooler, and the atmosphere is heating from the bottom up, which is, of course, the greenhouse gas prediction. Now we want to look at the ocean, because the ocean, if you think about it, is going to mitigate climate change and warming caused by increased CO2 for the simple fact that CO2 dissolves in the ocean, forming carbonic acid. And if you look here, carbon dioxide and water form H2CO3, carbon dioxide, which then gives rise to the hydrogen ion, which is the acidic component, and the bicarbonate ion. And that can further degrade to a second hydrogen ion and carbonate ion. So the ocean counters global warming by taking about 20 to 25 percent of the carbon dioxide emissions out of the atmosphere. If we didn't have the ocean, warming would be far worse. A percentage of this then, and it's a very low percent on an annual basis, is transferred to minerals, carbonate minerals, on the ocean's floor. You've heard of the White Cliffs of Dover? Well, those are made of calcium carbonate. They were once on the ocean floor, and they were made by precipitate of calcium and carbonate, which creates beautiful limestone. The problem is the oceans are getting warmer. And as you know from having had the experience of drinking warm soda, as temperatures go up, the liquid can absorb less CO2. And the same is true in the ocean. Hooray, the CO2 dissolves in the ocean. It mitigates climate change effect. We love our planet for having these, all these different reactions of the system. But now we're going to be introduced to the evil twin of global warming, which is ocean acidification, the next major climate headache. The increased absorption of CO2 has increased the acidity, which means decreasing the pH, of seawater already by 0.1 pH units. This doesn't sound like a lot, but it means that acidity has increased by 30% in the past 150 years. So the 0.1 unit sounds small, but that's a 30% increase. Under a business as usual scenario where we don't control CO2 emissions, acidity is predicted to increase by 150% within this century. At that level, oysters, clams, sea urchins, shallow water corals, deep sea corals, and certain plankton that use calcium carbonate to make their shells are predicted to have great difficulty doing so. The amount of available calcium carbonate decreases as pH decreases. Thus, it becomes more and more difficult for organisms to make shells, and the rate at which shells dissolve back into the ocean increases. At a certain pH, each of these organisms will stop being able to maintain their shells. Now, you may think this is theoretical only, but here we have an example of it, one of these shelled planktons, and you can see it was put in slightly lower pH water, and after 45 days, most of its shell had dissolved. So you can imagine the amount of energy the living organism would have to expend to try to maintain its shell. At some pH, it would simply not be able to have enough energy to survive. The other thing we know which is kind of amazing, is there are naturally acidic areas in the ocean. Can you guess where they are? If you said 
thereby places in the ocean where the crust of the earth is emitting carbon dioxide from volcanoes, let's say, and therefore the water acidifies. Give yourself a pat on the back because that's exactly right. Near ocean hut vents where there's a lot of CO2 coming out of the earth's crust. And in these areas, all the organisms I'm talking about are either extirpated or very rare. And that's what this says. Observation from naturally occurring parts of the ocean that have lower pH confirm that these kinds of marine life will be adversely affected by acidification. Decreasing pH also decreases the productivity of plankton, and thus there is reasonable fear that oceanic food webs will be affected by acidification. And plankton is the base, the primary producer in marine food webs. Decrease in marine photosynthesis sets in motion a positive feedback loop, whereby reduced photosynthesis means more CO2 stays in the water, which causes increased acidification, which decreases photosynthesis more, which increases acidification, etc., etc. Historically, the oceans have acidified at times in the past, in the ancient past, and the result has been the extinction of reef-forming corals. But I don't want you to think that that's great news, because currently there are tens of thousands of species of animals that depend on coral reefs. And there's a huge number of human beings who depend on the economic activity that results from those coral reefs. And in terms of biodiversity, it took tens of millions of years for reef forming corals to redevelop. And there is no guarantee that in the future that would happen again. So we are lucky to have coral reefs now when they disappeared in the past. Additionally, it is now predicted that if things don't change, that by 2080, acidity will be so high in the oceans that reef-forming corals will not be able to build. They will dissolve faster than they can be rebuilt. Now, let's just review, just so you know it, there are three ways climate change affects corals. The first is bleaching, which we've talked about and we saw in the movie Chasing Corals. Coral bleaching occurs when corals eject their symbiotic algae. And their symbiotic algae is what makes them such a super organism because they can photosynthesize, or the algae can photosynthesize, and provide energy for growth. And the coral itself can prey on prey and provide nutrients. So the, the pair does really well. So corals eject their symbiotic algae under certain conditions which aren't well understood. But one thing we know that seems to be correlated with all of the ejection of algae, all of the coral bleaching, is increased temperature of surface water. And there have now been several bleaching events in the last two decades, and they've all been associated with high temperatures. Two, sea level rise. Corals need to be close to the surface to survive. They need light. Increased sea level rise, if it occurs quickly enough, could prove challenging for corals. Three, reduction in growth due to acidity, that the acidity itself will cause uh, corals to spend more and more energy maintaining the platform on which they live. Eventually, they will not be able to grow. The last thing I want to talk about is the climate model that we use to understand the temperature of the Earth. This model has been developed over the last 150 years, and it is used for making projections about the future. And the way these models work is they simulate processes that affect global temperature. They make mathematical relationships of these processes, and then they look at what the effect of various perturbations would be. Let's take a look at that for a second. So here is a picture of the model, and what you can see here is some of the boxes in the model. So for example, the human emission of greenhouse gases and the natural emission of greenhouse gases and the removal of heat and carbon dioxide by the ocean, et cetera, et cetera. These are all aspects of the model. And that model is then put into mathematical form and we go forward and look at what will happen if we'd like to say double the rate at which humans produce carbon dioxide. And we make predictions from that. So that's how these models work. Of course, that's like two or three years of grad school trying to learn how to build them. And maybe you will do that and it'll be very exciting. You'll come back and tell me about your amazing climate work sometime in the future. The models themselves are improved by continuous refinement. And this allows them to make more and more precise predictions and more and more they have the ability to explain the data that has already been observed. And finally, the current model explains the last 100 plus years of observations very well. So let's take a look at that. Here it is. The current model, which is this yellow area, 
That is the range of predictions it makes. And the black line is the actual temperatures. And you can see that except in the late 1800s and once in the mid-1920s, the temperature always falls within that area of prediction. An interesting thing is happening here. Since about the 1980s or 90s into the 2000s, the actual temperature is reaching the upper level of the predictions of the model, which suggests that the model is conservative. In other words, in other words the model is underestimating the effect that human beings and anthropogenic carbon is having on the temperature of the Earth. Into the future, the major input of, of CO2 into the atmosphere is projected to be fossil fuels. And as we said earlier, this is abetted by deforestation. If deforestation occurs, there are fewer trees to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And the projections are as follows. In 2010, the projection was 389 parts per million, and we actually went over 400 by 2013. By 2050, we're expected to be at 560 parts per million, which is about a doubling of the pre-industrial concentrations. And then there will be another doubling 50 years after that by 2100 to 1390 parts per million. Those are the projections. Many climatologists see 450 parts per million. And I remind you, we are currently at about 408 as a tipping point. And what the tipping point means is that climates will begin to change and they'll change irreversibly, which means that even if we were to cut back to current levels or below, there would be new climate patterns set in motion on the globe and there would be no guarantee that we would go back to what we have now. That's what we mean by tipping point. Tipping points, of course, in terms of climate, tell us about scary changes in the future and that these changes will undoubtedly have an adverse effect on human society. Now, there is uncertainty in the model, and there are poorly understood processes, tipping points, and emergent properties that cause us to not understand the future with a reasonable amount of certainty. We are sure about the warming aspects of it. We are sure there's going to be climate change. We just don't know exactly what it's going to be like. Two poorly understood processes that we've already looked at have been the effect of cloud cover on warming. And we've already discussed these, you know. And also the effect of air pollutants. Cloud cover we've talked about. I'm going to go through this very quickly. Warmer temperature creates more clouds. If they are thick, low clouds, they will probably decrease the surface temperature. Why? You should remember that. Okay, I'll tell you the answer now if you had time to think about it. Thick, low clouds will reflect light back into space. Less visible radiation gets to the surface of the Earth, and therefore the thick clouds have the effect of mitigating increasing temperature. Thin, high cirrus clouds will increase surface temperature. Why is that? Take a second to think about it. Okay, you got it? Thin, high clouds do a better job at retaining heat, at, at being greenhouse gases, and retaining the infrared from the Earth and sending it back to Earth. And we also talked about the effect that decreased light will have on decreased photosynthesis, which means there'll be more carbon dioxide, which will increase the warming. That's a third feedback loop we've talked about. Scientists don't know which one will predominate. And this is a variable that introduces uncertainty into the projections. There's another problem uh, with high clouds is that jet contrail those condensation trails that come out of the back of jets may have an effect. There's preliminary evidence that the contrails build clouds that heat the atmosphere. So stay tuned on that one. More research is being done. What about air pollution? Aerosols and soot, soot is just uh, dark particles, carbon-based particles of poorly burned material, affect the temperature of the Earth. How? Some particles absorb light energy and others reflect it back into space. So the ones that absorb light energy will heat up the atmosphere. The ones that reflect it back into space will cool down the atmosphere. In fact, some scientists and engineers have suggested suspending reflecting particles into the upper atmosphere as a solution to increase CO2 levels. So this is called geoengineering, where we actually fly planes at high altitudes and just put out a bunch of these reflecting particles. Does that sound a little crazy to you? And so the effects of aerosols and soot are a complicating factor in global warming, and especially the models, and they are not well understood. So that's it for today. I hope you now have an understanding of why we say that humans have had a, a big role or are causing the current warming. And I hope you understand how the models have been developed and what they try to do. And at this point, that they look like 
They are conservative. They do have uncertainty in predicting the future, but they've been really good at predicting temperature. Next time we'll go on to the potential effects of global warming and climate change on the planet. And until then, study hard.